Well, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, uh, depending on your time zone. Thank you, you all, for joining me today for the fifth of our Columbia CVIPS lecture series on the AEC experience relating to COVID-19. I'm Fenioski Peñamora, Director of Columbia Center for Buildings, Infrastructure, and Public Space, and Professor at Columbia's Fu Foundation School of Engineering and Applied Science. As the events of the last week have demonstrated, we are living during challenging times, characterized by divides and distrust. I hope we are achieving a better understanding of social and economic injustice. Along with many of our colleagues in New York City and around the world, the faculty and staff of the Center for Buildings, Infrastructure and Public Space would like to add our voice to those denouncing systemic and institutionalized racism. We all need to build a better future for our city and for our world, a world characterized by respect, opportunity, and collaboration. These lectures bring together people to address the impact, response, recovery, and preparedness of the AC industry to the coronavirus pandemic. But they are also linked to the relation of social, economic, and environmental justice to the new normal in the AC community post-COVID. Our first five speakers were all based in the United States, working either in municipal government or the private sector. With the sixth lecture today, we take the discussion to infrastructure in Paris and the reimagination of transportation and urbanism with its implication for economic justice. Subsequent talks will focus on work in London, Chicago, and Sao Paulo. Please check our website to see more information about our next speakers and my co-moderators. I also would like to thank the organizations with whom we are collaborating in presenting these lectures. They are the American Council of Engineering Companies, New York, thanks Jay Simpson. The American Institute of Architects, New York chapter, thanks Benjamin Prosky. The American Society of Civil Engineers, thanks Tom Smith. The Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization, thanks Lance Brown, and thanks for being here with us today and for the CSU joining in. The Construction Management Association of America, New York and New Jersey chapter. Thanks, Vinnie Falkowski, and thanks for agreeing to co-moderate on July 7th. Engineering New, New Record, thanks, Jan Tuckman, and the National Academy of Construction, thanks, Wayne Crew, thanks for being here today. Today, I'm pleased that Marilisa Stigliano has joined me by Zoom to be co-moderator and respondent. Marilisa is Director of Operations at AECOM, here in New York City. She received her master's degree from Columbia's Food Foundation School of Engineering and Applied Science and serves at the advisory board of the Centers for Buildings, Infrastructure, and Public Space. Welcome, Marilisa. Our speakers today, the sixth in the series, is Catherine Barbet, Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Société du Grand Paris. At the Société du Grand Paris, she is responsible or leading the efforts to ensure the effective collaboration of the many politically autonomous communities in the Parisian region on a massive infrastructure project building 200 kilometers of new underground railway around Paris. From 2001 to 2008, Catherine served as planning director for the city of Paris. She's an architect and also holds degree from the Institute of Political Studies in Paris and from the prestigious National School of Administration. You can see her full bio on the CVIPS website. The topics of her talk is COVID-19, impact on the Paris region transportation and urbanism. I look forward to hearing about her take on what is happening now in the Parisian region. Thank you for being here with us today, Catherine. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I try, I, you will understand what I'm trying to explain to you. Um, it's an opportunity for me to talk about the impact of the COVID-19 on the Paris region and transportation and urbanism. It's also an opportunity to talk about the project I'm working for. Uh, I've been working for it in the past 10 years at the Grand Paris Express project. So it's both uh, explanation and both things I will give you now. Please, next slide. Just a few, a little introduction for those who do not know Paris as well as I do. Um, you see three maps comparing Paris, London, and New York at the same scale 
and giving you a few figures of the floor area of Paris, London and New York City and underground Paris region. So you see that Grand Paris metropolis, London and New York City are quite comparable in terms of floor area and number of inhabitants, but the Grand Paris region is much bigger. It's really a region in the French meaning of the, uh, of the name, but not only, and it has 12 million inhabitants. And that will be the scale I will talk about because it's the scale of the transport authority for the Paris region and also the scale um, that is the, the most uh, adapted one for uh, urban planning and uh, planning in general. Next, please. So also in introduction, just a few figures about the impact of COVID-19 on Paris region. Uh, the Paris region was the most impacted region in France. It's not surprising. It's the capital region, it's the same as in New York. Uh, and uh, as you see, the number of deaths in France was less, a few days ago, 29,000 deaths. So uh, compared to 66 million inhabitants in the Paris region, the number of deaths was higher because the proportion was 600 deaths per million inhabitants. The map on the left side shows you the number of deaths compared um, in, well, the number of deaths in March and April, April 2020 compared to April and March 2019. So it was higher by 23% in France in average, but it was higher by 88% in the Paris region and even higher in the Seine-Saint-Denis, the um, department on the northeast side of the city of Paris, which is the department populated by uh, the poorest people in the region. Next, please. So third slide of introduction, the impact of COVID business, just um, the timetable. Lockdown started on March 17. Lockdown was pars partially eased on May 11th. And for instance, retail shop uh, that were not for food could reopen. And on June the second, parks, garden and museum could reopen as well, but cafes and restaurants couldn't receive public inside, only on outside terraces. Since yesterday, uh, the government has allowed restaurants and cafes to allow people inside as well, and, and most museums will reopen very soon, but cinemas, theatres and concert halls still remain closed and we don't know for how long. Next one. So, first part of my presentation is about transportation and the, the, rest, the second one will be about uh, urban planning. So, public transportation is a very, it's really predominant in Paris region. That's important to know and especially, of course, in the very centre of it. The so next slide will show you the uh, share of ridership. So, next slide, please. Um, the share of ridership in the Paris region and as you see at the very bottom, uh, very bottom of the uh, right stick, uh, you will see that there are 20% of ridership every day uh, that is uh, covered by public transport. That's eight, a little more than 8 million um, transport in 2010. That's even more nowadays because it has increased a lot. And as far as I read, I think it's more or less the same proportion and the same number as in New York City area. So it's, it's very high, high and of course it's much, the further you go inside um, the center of the metropolis, the more, than, the more the use of public transportation is higher. Next one, please. Also, uh, the next one describe the capacity in terms of public transport of the Grand Paris region. Uh, as you say, as you see on this map, there's a lot of uh, existing railway line, uh, either regional train or express regional network or subway in Paris or tram. And most of these, as you see on the map, even if it's a small map, are radial lines. So it's very crowded. It's very crowded also uh, because 20 the ridership has increased of 20% in the first decade of the 21st century, and it has carried on increasing in, in, in the past 10 years. So it's very saturated and 
because it's on these uh, radial lines, it's all directed towards the center of the metropolis. And next one. That's why the Grand Paris project has been uh, decided by the French government, not the regional local transport authority, and voted by a law passed by um, Hassan Parliament uh, in 2010. And it decided to build a new network that would be mainly circular and then that would help to make, to build really a network between the most important radio lines, either train or metro lines uh, or express subway lines. So you can see it's a red dot, uh, the red line on the map. It will be easier to see it on the next slide. Um, so next slide shows the uh, map of the Grand Paris Express project I'm working for, 200 kilometers of new subway lines and 68 new stations, most of them in connection with uh, what is um, the uh, existing railway lines already. And uh, next slide would be even better uh, to show you that it really creates a, a network in the railway system of the Grand Paris region where these spots are either orange or red or black. It's connection with the railway system of the Paris region. Blue, it's only with the tram. Next slide quickly, just to show, to give you a few figures about this project. It's a huge one. It will be automatic railway, automatic subway, sorry, mostly underground, 90% underground, and very fast speed compared with the historic metro. So we hope it will help to move people from one part of the region to another. Well, we hope or we have hoped because obviously perhaps the situation will change in the coming uh, decades. Um, next one showed that the construction work has already started. This map was last year and you see that all is red. The civil engineering had started and the yellow parts of it were the preparatory works had started. So a lot of it has already started. Studies started 10 years ago, but the construction is most of it underway in, I would say, one, half, of, half of it. And of course, the expenditures are also uh, started and have reached a, a high level also uh, nowadays. So what happened after the lockdown? Next slide, please. The construction sites were closed from March 17th to April 20th. But now it has started again. And because we are um, a public corporation set up by the state, we have to be uh, exemplary. And so uh, we have tried to start as much as possible. So every construction site has started again. All boring machine, 11 to 10 old boring machine have, are active now. Uh, but of course, the productivity is not as good as it was previously because social distan distancing, sorry, distancing measures adopted for construction side uh, have slowed down the pace uh, by 50 uh, to 30 percent. So it's not as fast as it used to be. So we don't know yet if the schedule will be reached or not. Um, all there are other projects also in the Paris region, not as big, of course, as this one, but a small um, metro line that are um, make, made longer for a few kilometers, like uh, number four or number 11, and or they all have resumed as well. The Olympic Games had not, well, the construction works have not started yet, so it was not so difficult for them to cope with the previous schedule because they were still in the study phase phase, and uh, so they say they haven't suffered any delay as yet. Next one. So as a conclusion for this first part, what can we draw for conclusion? Um, okay, the whole public transport network now is reopened and functions with the same frequencies as before. It's this week, the week before it was not so good. 
uh, we had made we have made mask usage compulsory and until yesterday to avoid saturation employers uh, should give a certificate to their employers allowing them to travel during rush hours but it has been it has been cancelled yesterday to encourage more people to go to work because ridership, ridership is still very very low 20 to 30 percent of the previous figures and people are really afraid to travel by public transport again uh, because it was so crowded previously that they are afraid to face the same situation, which is not at all the situation. I've tested it three or four times and it looks really empty and very dull with all these people wearing masks everywhere. Anyway, and of course the revenue of public transport authority is strongly affected. Uh, it has, uh, it says officially that it has lost nearly uh, 2 billion euros on, the, on this year compared to a 10 billion euros uh, overall budget for the, for the year 2020. So the chairwoman of the Paris Region Public Transport Authority was also the chairwoman of the region asked the state for help and if not she's threatened to increase the price of the pass uh, that we buy, uh, all Parisians buy because it's uh, not very expensive, it gives you the, whole, but the possibility to travel for a whole month on the regional network wherever you go. So this, this is a question who will pay for it. And um, the question is also where do these people we used to go to through public transit go? So most of them prefer to walk if possible, to cycle or to share a car with colleagues. Next one. So some people thought that biking could become an alternative means of transportation, uh, but uh, no, don't dream, it will, it will not happen. Of course, it's summer, biking is increasing, is increasing incredibly thanks to the initiatives of local authority, particularly the city of Paris. The picture you see there is a picture of the Rue de Rivoli, the main east-west road in the center of Paris. Um, but uh, we're not Copenhagen, we're not Amsterdam, and we'll, ha we'll have to wait a long time before uh, a high proportion of uh, commuters takes a bike to commute to work. So of course there are, the, the figures have doubled, but the, 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 the level was very low previously. So it's, I've been a cyclist myself for 30 years, so I can say it's much better, but there's still a, a lot to do. Um, Car use won't increase very much because of congestion that existed before and also because the municipality tend to reduce um, the uh, space devoted to cars because of pollution. So the Rue de Rivoli is another example, but the Avenue de Général Leclerc just downstairs by my flat is just in the same situation. There is not as much room for cars as previously. Uh, next one, please. And anyway, uh, we have, uh, we've lost the picture on the way, but anyway, uh, what we can say is that uh, we um, have to transform road space into pedestrian area uh, sometimes to improve the uh, conditions of both pedestrians and cyclists because uh, in Paris it's okay, there's a good tradition of a good quality public space, but sometimes in the suburban department, uh, too much room has been devoted to cars and there's not enough room left for either pedestrians or bicycles. So there's a lot of work to do to adapt it to new conditions of transportation that could last long, that could last long definitely. And that could last long also because of the impact on urbanism and that's the second part of my presentation. So please, next slide. Um, the question I was uh, asking to myself and I'm asking to you as well and is uh, will the impact of COVID-19 on urbanism bring uh, suburbia back again? Um, it's really a debate that takes more and more room in uh, professional publications but also in general newspapers and I try to give you a formal, some more information about it. So next please. Next slide, please. Ooh, thank you. 
uh, well, we've lost the picture as well, so we're losing more and more pictures on the way. Uh, so anyway, just to say that the uh, largest metropolis in Europe, Greater Paris is the largest metropolis in Europe, and uh, it has, as I said, 12 million inhabitants, and it has also uh, nearly 6 million jobs, so there's a lot of uh, um, tran transit in this uh, area, because as you obviously know, uh, just the same as in most metropolises in the world, uh, housing and jobs are not located in the same place. Next, next please. Uh, well, we've lost the third map, so really the PowerPoint has really suffered from crossing the, the Atlantic. Uh, I hope the next slides will show the maps better. Um, okay, the previous, previous though, I was, okay. So even if we can't, you can't see the map, I just wanted to say that urbanization has sprawled in the Paris region in the last 60 years and that as it happened in America, perhaps not as strong as in America, but anyway, uh, suburban development have taken a lot of place and in the contrary, the population of the very center of the metropolis has decreased. Paris had three, the city of Paris had three million inhabitants at the beginning of the 20th century. It has only two million inhabitants nowadays, so you see the proportion is a high. Next one, please. So housing is still concentrated in the central area of uh, the Paris region, even if urbanization has sprawled in the outskirts. This is a map of the density of housing, and the darker it is, the densest uh, population is, and of course, Paris is much more uh, dense than the rest of the uh, metropolis and the Paris region is, especially the cinema, is nearly empty in many, many areas. So housing is still concentrated, but next one, jobs are, well, jobs have disappeared as well, so it's a bit difficult to speak without maps. Um, jobs remain concentrated in central Paris and in the immediate outskirts much more concentrated than housing, so it's difficult also uh, to, um, um, well, we need public transportation to join jobs and housing, and as far as the job conditions are still the same as they were before COVID-19. Social division remains strong also in central Paris. Next slide, but perhaps no map as well, I'm afraid, so uh, We've lost the map. So uh, just to say that, of course, um, many poor people live in the northeast part of the, um, uh, well, northeast part of the uh, region, uh, while westiest people are living in the west part of the city of Paris and the southwest part of it. So there's still a strong division. Next one, perhaps. I wonder if there will be a map this time. No, there are not, no maps, so probably the end of the presentation will be a little more dull without maps. Um, so I wanted to show you that the Grand Paris Express will facilitate access to jobs in neighborhoods with new stations. And uh, of course, a map would have helped, but you have to believe me because on the 68 new stations of the Grand Paris, uh, uh, a large number of them uh, are located in fairly poor areas where people need public transport to commute and the other half of it is located in business centers and business districts like La Défense for instance or Saint-Denis so it will help the connections between these two sort of locations. Next one if there is any map, if there is none it's well I'm sorry but uh, it will be difficult then to, uh, to talk about it. I see also that we have lots of PowerPoint. Um, so shall I carry on talking? Um, it's a bit complicated to make the presentation in that conditions. But anyway, um, if we can come back to the presentation, that would be fine. If not, it's mainly text now, so it's easier to uh, explain it without maps. So. My first um, conclusion about COVID-19 is that it has probably deeply changed 
work habits in the Paris area. Uh, during lockdown, one employee out of four was working from home full time. Uh, it's a lot. It's probably the same proportion in New York and in many, many metropolises as well. But it's important because uh, work from home was not very uh, frequent in France at that time. Um, the uh, Regional Public Transport Authority predicts that, uh, okay, we're back to it, uh, predicts that 70% of white collar workers and 20 of other employees will still telework at least part time until the end of the summer. And there could still be 50% of the workforce to the end of 2020, and perhaps still the same proportion in 2021. And of course, the Regional Public Transport Authority has to make the most serious predictions because, as I told you previously, their, um, their receipt, what the, the money they receive for public transport is directly connected to the number of people who go to work by public transport. If they stay at home, of course, they won't get as much money and they will have difficulties to balance their budget. Um, we are it's, we're still at the beginning of the discussion about the impact on commercial buildings and business districts. Um, it's prob it will probably be very high. Um, it has to be evaluated, but some important companies like the automobile company Peugeot who has, which has uh, eight, uh, 80,000 employees, but most of them are workers, but they have also employees in, in offices. Uh, they consider making work from home the rule nowadays. So it's, uh, it's important also uh, to know that big companies and small ones are considering uh, transforming totally their conditions of work in their offices. Uh, and every day the economic newspaper are just discussing that point with precise example. And of course, the impact on the housing market could have also a lasting effect. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so we probably uh, think that COVID-19 will have a lasting effect on urbanism in general in the Paris region. Why? Because uh, it's also my personal conviction is that um, living in city centers is not so funny in times of pandemia because you feel insecure because there are too many people and you feel uncomfortable because the apartments are small and expensive and they have no private gardens and sometimes also most of the time also no private balconies. So it's difficult to live there and it, there's no interest in living there anymore just because cafes and restaurants were closed, gardens were closed, cinemas are still closed, theater, and all the amenities of living in a central metropolis have disappeared. So in comparison, those who were living in suburbs, in small towns, in the countryside, who had a small house with a garden, even a very small garden, who had a, a garage where they could set their office if they the children were too noisy inside the house, that sort of situation suddenly became more attractive, even if these people were not so happy previously to live there just because their transport conditions and times uh, were too uh, high in comparison with people living in the center of the metropolis. So living in suburbs becomes more attractive. Of course, we haven't studied it yet, but it's also interesting to read that real estate agents say that it has already had some effect on the housing market and there has been they say uh, 60 more internet research for houses in the outer departments from the Par from paris region uh, so cinema and the uh, evelyn and so the, the really outer departments 50 kilometers from paris center more or less compared the compared to research in april 2019 and there are also other testimonies who say that uh, the more and more people are interested to buy what we previously called maison de campagne, um, houses used for weekends uh, in the countryside because it was fun to have lockdown there instead of being locked down to the center of Paris in a small flat. Um, I still believe that, of course, these locations will be 
chosen by people who have the choice if they still connected with fast train connections because um, work from home will probably remain at a high level but companies will want to have their salaries at least one or two days a week in the on their premises so people are still have to uh, travel to jobs um, at the same time next one please and so probably the next slide thank you so grand paris express will probably help and that's probably one reason it's not the only one why the project is not threatened but the other reasons of course is that it's as i say nearly halfway uh, being built uh, it's also that it's uh, important uh, for the government to spend money on the construction sector uh, to help the uh, enterprise in this uh, very important sector for the economy to keep on being busy but it's also that the project it will be even more useful for the people who move to the outer suburbs to live in houses with gardens instead of small apartments uh, they will have to commute as i say longer distances and so they have to have the possibility to do it and by car is just impossible because of the, there is too much traffic so the faster network will help them to reach their workplaces still concentrated in the summer in the center and it will also perhaps encourage alternative city centers to develop in the outskirts of paris around the new stations of the grand paris and there are many uh, development projects around it like you can see perhaps on the next map the next slide please no the map has disappeared as well sorry uh, so you won't see about the, the urban development projects in the neighborhoods with new stations but anyway we can go to the next slide and my presentation will be soon finished so can we go to the next slide please yes uh, well i think it's enough because without any map it's no good carrying talking thank you for your attention Great, thank you, Catherine. And you know, although we couldn't see the maps, uh, I think we all imagined ourselves how life in Paris could be, even if it was for 30 minutes. So thank you for that dream. You know, we we all uh, we all look at Paris as an example of uh, of re re really a different type of you know life and behaviors, and we're all looking at Paris right now, especially especially in the light of COVID-19. Um, so this presentation was was great, you know, and we have a few questions coming in and, you know, I really like to kick off the Q&A portion of, of this presentation, uh, giving really a positive speed to spin really to COVID-19. Um, and, you know, this is, many people are talking about, you know, this being our opportunity, uh, not only to imagine and build a, a new normal, but really a better normal. Uh, to really make sure that we build a new infrastructure, new cities that, you know, really look towards a more sustainable future and a more equitable society. So what is your personal vision for Paris? Uh, what would be the new, what would be the better normal for Paris uh, uh, coming, uh, coming after the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis? Well, uh, as I say, uh, I think, um we're probably at the beginning of a cycle where the shift towards um, suburban areas will move again uh, in that direction. It, um, it had never stopped, in fact, and many people are interested in living uh, in the suburb because uh, housing is cheaper in comparison with central Paris. They have more floor area for the same price uh, and also because um, France was still a very rural country 50 or 60 years ago so people have still the nostalgia of uh, living in the countryside close to the nature and of course the environmental discussions nowadays has given some more interest in these questions so this, ten this tendency had never disappeared and many people still um, wanted to invest in a small house either a new built house in a suburban area or a small house in the countryside not too far from the metropolis but uh, i'm sure the tendency will become uh, higher nowadays uh, because as i said the uh, drawbacks of living 
in the center of the city appeared, appeared so quickly. And this added to the um, environmental crisis and the fact that the heat in the center of the city is higher and higher and makes it sometimes very uncomfortable in small flats and buildings that haven't been built in that purpose because well, a high proportion of buildings in the in Paris, for instance, are have been built before World War II, so in a much cooler period of uh, of time. Uh, I think that the tendency uh, will uh, develop and uh, give more interest in the um, housing market outside the city, and this is a good news as well because uh, this housing market was. Uh, problematic in some way because uh, urban planners started questioning about what would happen to people who bought these small houses. Um, they are getting older. If no, no new people uh, are interested to live in these areas, then uh, this older population will have difficulties to live there or to sell their houses to have a smaller flat uh, next to conveniences adapted to old age and that sort of thing. So if, if the new market opens, that it will give more value to these areas and more values to these, uh, uh, the people who invested there. And a uh, high proportion of them were probably members, members of the uh, yellow jacket movement, gilet jaune uh, movement we had uh, in France uh, one year ago. Uh, people disappointed of what happened to their environment and the loss of value that it had uh, achieved. And um, it's good news to know that, well, there will be more interest and more value in that sort of environment, which has qualities as long as people can work from home part of the week. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, again, I just wanna thank you for a uh, presentation and I'm and, and sorry for the difficulties that you had with the uh, images. Uh, I really apologize to you as well as to all the participants, but you did an incredibly good job on explaining with words. And I, sometimes I feel that imagination and using our uh, imagination is more powerful than actually graphic. You know, you <laughs> say like a picture is worth a thousand words, your imagination is uh, worth a thousand pictures. So I think uh, it's really good. And I want to go back to some of those um, images that you describe in terms of how the population changed and how um, you know Paris grew um, to kind of the Grand Paris and also the shift of the uh, residential and the employment and there are a couple of questions that we have received from the audience that are related and following up on the question that Marilisa asked in terms of the urbanization and we have a question for Alka Yakaraya as well as from Janice and they are looking at how do you see in the future the dynamics from the urban to the suburban? Um, how do you fee see that people will be either leaving the urban nucleus or coming to the urban nucleus? Um, is the pandemic the, th the tipping point? Is the high rents? Is the employment? Is the kind of um, lifestyle? Um, how do you see that changing? Because particularly um, your project is looking on how to shorten the distance in time, more or less, you know, how to move people from point A to point B as quickly as possible and allow them to still have a uh, living outside of the center of Paris, but still be able to reach there, like you're saying, 30 minutes or 50 minutes very quickly. So how do you see, and those are the questions from some of the audience. Well, um... We're just making prediction at the moment because, yes. of course, uh, all of us, we are in a lot of uncertainties and, uh, well, that's what is worrying. That's also what is interesting, I can say, especially for planners and uh, architects and engineers, because we are preparing the city of tomorrow. Um, if there are no more pandemic, or the pandemic comes back very softly, gently, if I can say so. Um, city center will soon recover, I think. It's already what happens in Paris, where the terraces of the cafes are just spilling with people everywhere, and young people are just having picnic and drinks all together on the banks of the river, 
and it's really well it's summertime and it's really lively and i've seen people uh, dancing on the pavement with a small jazz orchestra in the close to the Lux luxembourg garden on saturday so it's really lively and it, well i was really so happy to see it because as you know i've been the director of planning of the city of paris so paris is in my heart and uh, i was so sad to see it there and i'm so happy to see it lively again but um, it's good for students it's good for young people and young uh, people without children it's good for uh, old people in good conditions uh, it's not so good for families as we notice and so i think the uh, people more interested in having a different life outside Paris are families, families with kids and these will certainly compare the budget and if it's the same budget they will say okay we can work from home two or three days a week, uh, we are employees in a bank or, could I, or in an um, insurance company or public employees, I mean of course not people, uh, shop assistants or that sort of people because they have to be on the premises but a lot of people are not necessarily supposed to be on the premises every day i think this will change and they will more um uh, they will be more interested in living in uh, as i say in suburbia and especially further suburbia where prices are still uh, accessible um and i think it's um how could i say um yes uh it's a luck it's if suburbia can really um accept this challenge perhaps it will give them a new life uh bringing more new buildings perhaps around the stations and small density and small city centers and small retail shop they haven't got yet because it was all organized around car and car driving and car driving, even in suburbia, for other reasons, for environmental um, environmental reasons, will also be more and more difficult. So, uh, okay, the comeback of suburbia, but with a different style of living, with more walking, more biking, and that's good for health, and less car driving than it nowadays is the situation. Is, you, did Catherine. I answer your questions? Uh, yes, uh, uh, very, very well. And, and I think I like the different types of demographics and what yeah. are the preferences and how it will work. I think this is very important. Um, I just want to check, Marilisa, are you still on? Yes, I'm yes. on. Thank uh, you. And I have a question from the audience for you, Katrina. Uh, it's more of a behavioral question. Uh, and I think that all employers uh, were very concerned about having their workforce to move from, you know, being at the office or in the client's office all the time to now having almost the entire workforce to work remotely and for such an extended period of time. But, you know, many surveys have shown instead that, that you know, the, the, the pace of work is still, you know, we still maintain a very high productivity and very high level of efficiency working from home. The question coming from the audience is, is that really sustainable? Um, you know, a lot of people have really, you know, big challenges working from home because it's almost like there is no separation anymore between your personal life and your professional life. You wake up in the morning and you're already in front of your computer. So that drove efficiency and productivity for our employers. But is that type of lifestyle sustainable? And do you see this as really the future of the workforce in, uh, in France, since even big employers like Peugeot have already mentioned that they would like to have their workforce to continue to work from home? Um, well, I think there was no choice. Uh, so companies had to admit it and to accept it and the main challenge is more the quality of the digital network than really uh, the willingness of companies. Um, let me explain. In my field, in the construction field, uh, we noticed that um, um, building permissions, well the government said that building permissions could be be a little longer in terms of a study uh, but of course the local authorities would give it which give it um, they um, 
they didn't have the same level of digital services. So, um, okay, it was good to say that it could be delivered in digital terms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if the connections are no good, if the level of equipment of the company and in the public sector, as I've been told, it was not the same level of uh, efficiency, then it won't work. Uh, I had a sort of meeting of that time, um, uh, a boarding um, meeting just uh, Friday morning uh, with a regional institution and the chairwoman of the region should introduce it, but she couldn't be online because of uh, uh, digital problems. And we had, we've experienced that today also. And the deputy president had also difficulties because he was staying at the very bottom of the Paris region in the uh, southeast part of it and borders of it. And the digital um, network was obviously not good enough. So I think that is the main challenge. In fact, it has to, it has to work. Um, first of all, it has, people have to be trained for it. People have to have proper computers for it. Some of my colleagues are using their telephone just because they were uh, locked down in, uh, in rural areas of France and uh, they couldn't have uh, uh, internet. And I mean, that's the main problem. Private life, that sort of thing. Um, I think it's not so important because you save the time of transportation. So you have a lot of time more. And if, even if your efficiency is not as good, well, you, you're more relaxed because you, you do not have to face public transport. Another problem was that schools were closed, but in normal conditions, schools shouldn't be closed. So um, your efficiency at home when children are not uh, playing in the same room as you're trying to work is, of course, totally different. And of course, I still think that you have to, ha to have meetings uh, on the premises of the firm at least once a week because if not it's more complicated and it's more complicated for students as well. Uh, many un Most universities have organized uh, video uh, conferences and, co and courses but if students cannot connect or if students uh, cannot see each other it's on the long period, it's difficult, and you probably experience it more than I do. But uh, anyway, it's still difficult. So I think it's not a problem of the firms being reluctant to it or that, because they won't have choice for it. Um, and more and more firms are just calculating that they will save a lot of money by renting less square meters of, of, of offices if they have less employees coming on their premises every day. So um, I'm more worried for our business centers because I'm not sure that the profitability of these buildings will be, will be as high as it used to be in the, previous, uh, uh, in the previous years. So that's another question that it hasn't been studied yet, of course. Thank you, Catherine. And, and, and actually, you, you lead to the question that we have from uh, one of our students, actually, Cindy Gu. Uh, she is one of our fellows in the Center for Buildings, Infrastructure, and Public Space. And she uh, was asking that now that this, uh, companies have experience moving people um, remotely and working, and, and, and in your project, um, you know, you're trying to connect um, kind of the Grand Paris um, and the out there with the center. Um, have you uh, seen a lot more interest from companies to move to the outer of um, uh, Paris, to be closer to where people will reside and to remove density? And another uh, part of that question is that um, has these pandemic and the impact that it has had on the working conditions of the different um, companies um, have put um, certain new demands to your project that were not considered when you initially uh, started the project uh, in terms of perhaps new stations to develop like business centers uh, in the outskirts. I don't know if those things have uh, surfaced in discussions um, uh, after the or during the pandemic. 
the, the pandemic is too recent to have any uh, uh, movement of that at, at the moment. But what I can say is that um, the Grand Forest project has tried to connect, as I tried to show through the maps we, you've seen, uh, the, the existing business centers that have located outside Paris in the previous uh, um, decades. So, for instance, La Défense, of course, but not only La Défense. There has been, in the past 30 years, a large movement of jobs moving from inside Paris to the um, closest outskirts of Paris. So, La Défense, naturally, but also the west part of Paris, Ici les Moulineaux and Boulogne. And also the north west part of Paris around the Stade de France and where we our premises our offices are located in fact and um, so um, this tendency was to be reinforced by the Grand Paris project as I said and it will still remain reinforced I suppose because as I said offices just can't disappear I mean they will be used differently probably but they can't disappear but uh, on the contrary, we see, and I think this won't change, strongly at least, uh, offices always go where offices are, have always already been located. So it's just like a sort of um, uh, effect that we had in any civilization of uh, retail uh, going the same way, in the same uh, location it has always been difficult to make it profitable to build business uh, building uh, outside in areas mostly devoted to housing uh, it, it never works it has to be close to other people working um, so we've tried to develop some but it doesn't work very well perhaps it will change a little because we suppose that what will really happen we suppose that people working from home from time to time that would need to have some sort of a, um, offices close to their house where they could print documents and have a photocopy and uh, scans and that all sort of thing so sort of a shared working place um, and they have started developing before the pandemic um, but the first um, lessons we learned from now on is that it's it was not made more dynamic because of the pandemic because lockdown was a strong lockdown so anyway you couldn't go to the we work uh, office next door you have to stay at home um, so I'm not sure it will change really the location of uh, of office premises it, it will just change the number of people moving to it every day and that I'm sure it will change Definitely. Thank you. Marilisa? Great. We have time for the last question. And this is a very interesting one, Catherine. Uh, wow. It just came through. So basically, uh, you know, with, with infrastructure projects like the Grand Paris Express, uh, you know, those are transit oriented development projects. And to a certain extent, though, this particular one uh, really will encourage people to use cars more right because people will move far away from city centers and they will have to drive to the uh, closest station of the of the Grand Prix Express to then get to the cities so mm -hmm. how does that concept in your mind that matches with you know the idea of a sustainable future and really to the idea of making our cities you know more workable as well well it was not the idea at the beginning and before COVID-19, we said that people were not ready to add, let's say, half an hour drive to go to the station and then uh, 45 minutes on public transport. It's too much compared with the average in the Paris region. It's too much. And this didn't exist in large proportion before the pandemic. We've started studying that with the uh, Institut Paris Région, the sort of uh, planning agency at scale of the whole region. And uh, the figures show that they did not, this didn't happen very frequently. Normally people drive more, not more than 15 minutes to, to go to the station. But that were in the Middle Ages, that was previously. If a work from home is still very developed and if people have to uh, 
go to their offices only twice a week, uh, they will probably be ready to, to spend more time on transit just because they don't do it every day. So I believe, but it's just a belief that people will probably drive longer distances provided the roads are, well, big enough. But as I say, in cinema, there's not that much traffic uh, and that much density of population, for instance. So it could happen. Uh, it could happen, but only for the, to reach by cars, the stations that are at, in the very um, far outskirts. Because in the metropolis itself, in the core of the region, um, the road network is not wide enough to accept more traffic. And we have refused to build a parking, more parking places uh, close to the stations to encourage that sort of phenomenon. And the local authorities, um, politicians, didn't want it either. So we don't uh, encourage it. And there are no more parking facilities after the network is built than before and the road network won't allow it. So the only situation where it could happen would be uh, in the uh, further outskirts, what we call Grand Couronne, so really outside, far away outside Paris, where I think and I hope that there will be new interest for people to move there. Did I answer your question? Sure, I think you, you really did, Catherine. And in general, although more people will be traveling to uh, transit li like the Grand Prix Express, uh, I think what you are saying is that, you know, the change of behavior we really need for people to go to the center of the city and go to, the, to their business, uh, to their offices uh, less often than now, you know, maybe once a week and maybe twice a week. So, yeah. so the, you know, the, the trends are still, you know, yet to be seen, but, you know, there's going to be a change in behavior for sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine, for a wonderful presentation. And again, apologies for the graph and apologies for um, the technical glitches, but as you said, those are some of the challenges and you had a meeting with uh, the regional um, kind of director and she couldn't really connect, even the vice um, regional director. So um, we understand and like you're saying, it goes back to infrastructure and our investment in infrastructure, yeah. not only in transportation, but also telecommunication. Yeah. I think yeah. those are very good points. And, and I think nowadays they will have to go hand, uh, hand in hand. So thank you so much for a, a wonderful, well, thought-provoking presentation. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for it. the invitation. That was a pleasure and a challenge, so I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you adapted very well. That shows how nimble and flexible you are. So thank you so thank much. Thank you. <laughs> and I also would like to thank Marilisa. She also has been very, very nimble thank and you, flexible. Uh, and thank you so much. Thank you for the good questions and, and moderating. Um, uh, it has been a, a great discussion. Um, I also would like to thank the different organizations that collaborate for this lecture series, uh, ACEC New York, AIA New York, ASCE, CMAA New York City and New Jersey, and particularly our new collaborator consortium for sustainable urbanization for joining us, uh, ENR, Engineering News Record, and NAC, National Academy of Construction. I also would like to thank Eric Mark Farling and Chris Levan, uh, two of our previous speakers who are joining us and listening to Catherine. So it's good to um, kind of see how we're learning from each other and seeing what we're doing in Paris, uh, LA and New York. I also would like to thank Dick Anderson, another of our co-moderator who is joining us today. Uh, Wayne Crew and Lance Brown, two of our collaborators. Uh, Lucio Soberman, uh, who is going to be next week co-moderator. Uh, Vinny Popkowski, one of our collaborators and co-moderator on our July 7th lecture. Um, I would like also to thank Jerry Buckwarder, uh, ASE Chief Operating and Strategic Officer, and Linda Tong, New York City Transit Chief Architect for joining us. Um, thank you also to my colleagues at Columbia who helped pull this together, including Michael Smith, Charles Chen, and Rick Bell. Uh, I can tell you that without them, we would not have been possible to uh, do this. And even though with the glitches, I'm telling you, it's not their fault, it's uh, technology and infrastructure. And I also would like to thank all of you for joining us um, from your home, from uh, if you are in an office, 
and uh, through our New York City and also around the world. Um, so thank you so much. Um, uh, if any of you uh, would like AIA continuing education credit, and those have been requested for this lecture. Yeah, so if you're looking for credit, please, I hope that you have filled out your registration number uh, in the Eventbrite. If not, please send an email to cbips at columbia.edu. Um, next Tuesday, we continue our lecture. Uh, we are going back to Los Angeles. So with Chris Levan, we started with LA Metro. Now we are going to go with our guest speaker, Deborah Wintrop, the Deputy Chief Engineer and Chief Architect of the Bureau of Engineering of the City of Los Angeles. And my co-moderator is going to be Lucia Soberman, uh, the U, uh, USC Beverly School of Engineering and Chair of the uh, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, following um, on June 30th, our speaker, uh, we are now going back to Europe and now we're going to London. Uh, it's going to be Peter Murray, Chairman of New London Architecture and Architectural Advisor, London Mayor Sadiq Khan. Uh, my co-moderator is going to be uh, Punima Kapoor, uh, the former Executive Director of City Planning here in New York City. I will say that that will be an interesting comparison mm -hmm. the same way that we're looking at Paris, LA, now bringing London for those comparisons. Now, for uh, our July 7th, we have our speaker will be Christine Flaherty, Senior Vice President of New York Health and Hospital, and she led the effort to create and adapt uh, health and hospital different uh, uh, centers to the COVID-19 crisis and developing uh, temporary facilities as well as strengthen the existing facility. Um, our co-moderator is going to be Vinnie Farkowski, President of CMAA New York and New Jersey, and um, Rick Bell, our Deputy Director from uh, the Center for Buildings, Infrastructure, and Public Space. So I would like to thank all of you for staying connected. And thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you so much, um, Marilisa, for such a wonderful uh, experience. Uh, Catherine, have a good evening. And Marilisa, having thank a good you. afternoon. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Pinovsky.